is here to talk about how to make your body cancer proof and heart attack proof. Welcome, Spencer. Hey, how you doing? Let me know when you're ready to be the OCB, right? Cancer and heart attack are pretty frightening things. When I look around, I see that this is a gathering of heroes. And we really come into our power in our 50s and 60s as humans, where we still have enough strength. still have enough strength to do what we want to do, but we've also got the experience, we've got the wisdom to know how to do it and what to do. The problem is a lot of people in the 50s and 60s are being distracted with heart attacks and cancer. So you, you know what to do, you've got your path, you've got your ability, you've got the courage to do it, I'm here to give you the time. All right, this is a two-hour course geared towards physicians that I'm gonna give in half an hour. So I'm going to ask that you hold your questions towards the end, because this is going to be a very fast and furious down All right, let's start with heart disease. Most common cause of death worldwide. First symptom is the heart attack. Typically, statin drugs are absolutely ridiculous. You have to take a huge amount of statins to have any kind of statistical difference in the arteries. And as we know, statins lower CoQ10, which is why people are often getting heart attacks in the first place. So I'm going to walk you through what I think is actually causing the heart attacks and the cancer so we can walk our way backwards. There's such a thing as a pseudo gene. It's a gene that doesn't work properly. It goes through all these parts. Can you all hear me? Just no. A little louder. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So there's a thing called a pseudo gene. And it means that the gene's not working properly. So we have a uric oxidase pseudo gene, which is why we get gout. We can't get rid of uric acid very well. We have... Uh, the phytolysase pseudogene, which is why we end up getting skin cancer. We can't deal with the UV. And we don't make vitamin C, gluconolamalactone oxidase, which is why we end up with heart disease. There are four mammals out of 4,000 ones that are known that have this vitamin C pseudogene. Fruit bats, some primates, guinea pigs, and us. Darn. Fortunately, nature finds a way. And to compensate, we have an amazing capacity to recycle red, uh, vitamin C in our red blood cells. It's the adaptation we've made. So you don't need a lot of vitamin C, but you need enough. Second cause, and this is how we treat our water systems. The way water is purified, you have to understand a lot of water is coming out of sewerage. Uh, and there's lots of nasty things floating around inside of it. Would it be better if I just talked like that? All right. Okay. So in order to purify the water, they're going to put aluminum in it, and what that does is it flocculates it. It takes the electrical charge off the water, and all the bits of junk stick together so it's easier to pull it out. The problem is they don't put the negative charge back in. Now, our blood has lots of little things floating inside of it. We don't want our blood flocculating, but when we're drinking water or bathing in water that has been flocculated, some of it gets into us, and this is what it starts to do. It makes the blood coagulate inside the body. You can see the fiber in here. This stuff is pretty abrasive. Technically, what it's doing is causes, it's dropping the negative zeta potential. We don't have to get into this, but what's important to understand is as the blood loses its electricity, as it becomes more electropositive, it crystallizes and becomes abrasive, and the arteries, which have a lining of uh, albumin on them that's negatively charged, the negative charge in the arteries is deflecting the negative charge in your blood cells so that it doesn't bump and scrape against your arteries. But when we lose the negative charge, right, the blood becomes abrasive and the arteries have no more protection. It shields down. Problems in the arteries don't occur everywhere equally. They show up in places where it bends, it curves. This is because it's getting turbulent in these locations. If you look at a river, you're gonna see that places where the water is bending and turning, that's where it starts to swirl. Now what happens if you've got swirling abrasive blood? And remember, there are a lot of places in the body where the blood is bending and twisting, right? So it's not just one little spot, it's not just the coronary. The whole uh, arterial chain has these bends. It's a fractal system. 
we're ending up sandblasting ourselves on the inside. Okay, this is what's causing it. The turbulent blood is abrasive and it is sandblasting our arteries on the inside. So let's walk through the pathway of this. I'll take my clock out so I can make sure I'm on time here. <clears throat> All right, so the first thing is we're drinking the wrong kind of water, uh, unwittingly. Uh, and the sandblasting starts to wear at the arteries, and because we don't have enough vitamin C, we can't fix it properly. We can't heal that bit of damaged tissue. It's a chronic wound. You've all heard of LDL and L, uh, the low density level of proteins, the bad uh, cholesterol. What this is doing is, is going and reinforcing the artery because what the body doesn't want is it doesn't want the artery to break and hemorrhage because that'll kill a person very quickly. So in the body's wisdom, it says, well, let me reinforce this bit of tissue. And the LDL protein has growth stimulants in it that reinforce, it's a wound repairing mechanism in the arterial wall. And so what it's doing is it's reinforcing, and as it does that, the artery wall gets thicker. That's the process of it, right? Now, what a lot of people think about plaque in the arteries is they think it's like this pipe. There's the artery, and there's this junk that's accumulated in it, like uh, the pipe of an old rusty house. Yeah? That's not how it happens. It's the wall getting thicker, okay? Now, any organ that gets thicker is an organ that's suffering. If the thyroid is low on iodine, goiter, the, the thyroid gets larger. Uh, if the heart's stressed, the heart gets larger. If the prostate loses zinc, the prostate gets larger. This is no different. This is a wound in an organ system that we are unfortunately having a difficult time maintaining. There's one other thing to understand, and that is when the plaque grows, Right over here, this here's the wall growing, the LDL, the LDL went in, and there's this one layer thick cap over the plaque. If this cap ruptures, this stuff comes out, it's very inflammatory, that's what's gonna cause possibly a stroke or a heart attack or any number of issues. And one of the things that the LDL does is it stabilizes this, all right? So if we're on drugs that are lowering LDL, well, we better do something to repair the tissue because we don't want to bleed out, and we better do something to strengthen the cap so it doesn't give us an emboli. All right, LDL promotes vascular healing, stabilizes the plaque, causes the growth, and if it keeps going, then artery can block up by half or three quarters or even completely. Well, how can that be a smart strategy for the human body to do that? It's not a problem as long as you have collateral blood vessels. This is the backup system, okay? The body would rather seal off a blood vessel completely that might rupture and give you a brand new one than let it rupture. You've probably heard of someone saying, oh my God, I went to the doctor, I went to the cardiologist, I had a stress test, 95% blocked coronary artery. How is this person walking around, right? I mean, if I sleep the wrong way, sometimes my, my arm will fall asleep. <laughs> the reason they're still walking around is because they have what? They have made a natural bypass for themselves. Great. Block their artery 100%. I don't care. I'd rather you didn't, but as long as you're making bypasses. I want to keep you guys in the game as long as possible. Right? We get as many heroes undistracted by their health as possible. All right. No. Thank you. Got to keep you in the game. Now, what about the person that everybody thinks is fine, and then all of a sudden, oh, you hear about Joe, he had a heart attack. He was right there in the parking lot. They went inside, he had like a 30% blocked artery. That's not so bad. What didn't this fellow have? He didn't have a natural bypass, all right? And they want to give it to you surgically. My, my hit on stents, if you put a stent in, it opens it up, clearly. It doesn't address the cause, and it will often be stenosis. You get a second and a third. If you have to, under emergency conditions, emergency meaning you have no collateral vessels, and you have a black artery, which is very dangerous, put a balloon in, stretch it out, and then get to work. All right. 
what stops the collateral vessels from forming in the first place? I got to quick on this. Okay, we have toxins like lead and mercury. Right? I have a good friend, he's a triathlete, he had a second stint. Why? Because he used to go to the shooting range, he had a lot of lead, you gotta stay clean. Here's another one, nicotine, I'll show you something, look at this. This is cigarette smoking in the United States. And you can see it comes up, right? Peak, comes up in the 30s, peaks in the 60s, it comes down. Look at the death from heart attack, it's the exact same thing, right? Why? Because nicotine suppresses new blood vessel growth. That's the connection there. And if you think you're gonna get away with it because you're chewing or snuff, no, it's the nicotine that's doing it, even if it's a patch. We have five hearts, we have the physical heart itself, but if you ask an engineer to take a look at it, there's no way the heart pumps all that blood. If you look at the capillaries between the arteries and the, and the veins, the blood actually stops and oscillates. The physical heart is not large enough or strong enough to do all the work. We have five hearts. We have arterial peristalsis. All the arteries have muscles on them. And as the blood goes through, it stretches and then squeezes and squirts it through. All right, we also have muscular venous assist. That means every time you move, the muscles around the veins, which do not have um, that kind of assist, it pushes the blood back. Diaphragmatic breathing, breathing in and out. As the diaphragm moves, it sucks and creates a pressure vacuum in the torso that sucks and pushes blood from your extremities. That's, how, that's the reason why giraffes don't pass out with their head up so high. Is the diaphragm. And then capillary action, this is how blood is pulled up trees. You need all of these, right? Let's say somebody's got calcification in their arteries, and that's a very common one. Well, the arteries stiff, it can't peristalsis, right? And then they don't get much, they don't exercise very much, and they breathe kind of shallow, right? And their blood's a little thick. Now the heart has to do all of it, and it's not designed for that. It's gonna, it's gonna be very stressful for that heart. So, We'll talk about how to keep the arteries from calcifying, venous assist to get up and move, breathe more deeply, and get your zeta potential back. Uh, so some of the things I'll do with clients, and I'll take a look inside, down and basically do ultrasound. I'm supposed to do ultrasound here and offer it, but at half an hour, there's just no time. Uh, this is what I like to do. It's very, uh, it's very quick. It's not invasive. You've all got these little red lines in the eyes in your sclera. This is your microvasculature. And you can, do you see how this one's getting all curved like this, right? The blood's not getting past this point and it's causing the vessel to become tortuous. Looking inside the eyes is a fantastic way to find out if you're starting to block up your blood vessels. And then what I want to see is, because I expect this in the occasional person that's getting older, right? It's going to happen. But what I want to see is, even though it's blocked here, sprouts of a particular kind, not the kind that look like cancer, but I want to see the sprouts that say this person is generating new blood vessels. We'll get back to that in a minute. Not only can you do this, but depending on where in the eye it is, you can actually determine where the blood flows are having problems, and then if you clear it up, you watch these things go away. I'm going to ask you the protocols. All right, so what are we doing? What's the way out of this? For the pseudogen, you take vitamin C. It doesn't have to be much. You take a gram a day, it's really enough. For the abrasive blood, potassium citrate, this stuff is very inexpensive. Right? They want to spook you saying, don't take potassium, you know, won't find more than 99 milligrams available in health food stores at a time because some woman, woman once who had kidney failure died. No, this stuff is fine. I take huge amounts of this stuff. It's like saying a banana is toxic. Okay, and it's got a negative three charge. It'll put the charge back in the water. I take a quarter teaspoon twice, three times a day in a glass of water or drink it down. My water now has a zero potential. My blood is moving properly. If you really need a little help, you do chelation, that's EDTA, it has a negative four charge, you don't do that your whole life, but sometimes you need a little help. LDL, this is uh, for Alliance Pauling. What he found out with Rath is that uh, if you put the LDL is binding to lysine in the arteries, if you take lysine orally, it'll bind to that, it won't bind to the artery, but you still gotta do something about the artery. I think that's not enough. Damaged arterial wall, another good physician. And by the way, this is the only man who ever got two and shared Nobel Prizes. Damaged arterial wall, chondroitin sulfate, arginine, and citrulline. Calcifications, vitamin K2, the MK7 version is more effective. High doses of this, you gotta have somebody watch your blood work. Low doses are fine. The vulnerable fibers cap, right? We're not, we're gonna lower the LDL. You gotta make sure the cap doesn't blow open and, and while we're driving a car, and that's the end. Go to cola, it's a cheap plant, it does it. Lack of collateral growth, niacin, nitric oxide, and clearly detox. Uh, here we go, shameless product placement. Okay, you can take all those ingredients I talked about, 
I've got them all in the little thing if you don't want to deal with it. Coupon code, part two. Cancer, boy, that's really scary, right? Okay, cancer is normally spoke about as it having four, uh, five stages, zero, one, two, three, four, five, zero. Is in C2, it's tiny, it's small, uh, no nodes, no metastases. One, two, and three, it's now starting to go into the nodes, getting bigger, four, it's metastasized. We need a bunch of stages well before that where we can intervene. Not here, I don't want to intervene at this point. All right, what causes cancer? Well, let's just go through them one time. All right, low oxygen. It shifts the cellular metabolism of the cell from Kreb's citrogastric cycle, which can burn anything, to glycolysis, which only burns sugar and not so well. The shift becomes irreversible. So once we have a cell that's gone to start burning sugar, as that's its only primary method, it's very hard to turn it around. Mutations this is the classic idea of how cancer comes along. And this is radiation, cell things, Fukushima, medical x-rays, God help us, 5G, I'm working on that one. Uh, chemical mutagens, and it's considered six to seven mutations in a cell is what it takes to get cancer. How many people are walking around with three and four mutations in cells? Yeah, a lot of us, unfortunately. Not a problem, just like blocked arteries aren't a problem if, and I'll get to the if part. Current model says that the mutations are happening in our progenitor cells, which are basically uh, stem cells. Adaptation, this is the one I want you guys to focus on. This is the slow state change of cells as they adopt to an increasingly dysfunctional environment. I believe it's mostly caused by toxic metals. Their ability to survive is the cancer. That's like going to the ghetto and they have, you know, they're like, gosh, there's no food, there's no water, what do I gotta do that changes some people's personalities? A lot of people in the ghetto, they're still the noble people, but some people, it brings the criminal part out of them. This is bringing the criminal part out of our, our cellular metabolism. Pumps transport as a channel, so it's gonna get a little technical. Let's go with it. Pumps push uphill, it takes energy. All right, so we have membranes. Every cell is a, is a membrane and lots of little things that allow to go back and forth. You can either, and the cell wants magnesium and potassium on the inside and wants to push the sodium and calcium on the outside. It does it with these things. It'll push it with a pump. Here's a pump. There's the sodium. Pushes it out. Takes energy. It can transport it. The body wants, these want to come in, right? The sodium's been pushed out but now wants to go back. It says, fine, you can bring the sodium back in to drag the glucose with you. Okay, that's transport. And sometimes it's a co-transporter, they get together, and sometimes it's an anti-porter and they flip, but it's using the strength of one to push another. Channels, just a whole bunch of stuff shoots through, right? And we've got gajillions of these things, which is a scientific term. The problem is molecular mimicry. Sodium and mercury are both 1.02 angstroms in size. Sodium has a plus one charge, divalent mercury negative, uh, plus two. Minutes. Okay, so what that means is when the mercury gets into a uh, pump, it might not get out again. Potassium 1.38, barium 1.35, charge one, charge two, it gets in, it can't get out. So what happens when these things get stuck in the pumps, channels, and transporters? The cell can't operate properly. All right, and what we end up with is microtumors. These are under half a cubic centimeter. They're like little warts. They're in this room. I've got them in my body, and we all do. Okay. It's not a big deal as long as they sit there. Half of men and women autopsied at car crashes have microtubers in the prostate and the breast, let alone they didn't even look in the lungs in the, um, in the colon. Okay, it's not a problem as long as our pH doesn't drop because when the pH drops, that's what triggers the microtumor to become invasive, okay? Okay, the Western approach, biopsy, surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, biopsy, terrible idea. If you think you've got a tumor, treat it as it, because when you go in to sample it and you pull out the needle, you're seeding possible tumor tissue. Oh, you just made it invasive. Okay, chemotherapy, hmm. Or radiation, well, you might kill the tumor, but what about all of the cells right outside the tumor that had two, three, four, five mutations? What did you just do to them? Yeah, you just pushed them up to seven mutations. There we go. Okay, this chemo makes sense. It started after the invention of penicillin. They wanted something in that same model. It had it to work in two days. Well, anything that's toxic enough to work in two days is going to be pretty harsh on us because we are made of the same things that the cancer is made of. We're not a bacteria. Same cells. If it kills cancer in two days, it's going to be hard on us. Well, what about all the things that would have worked slowly, 5, 10, 15 days, gracefully, gently? 
No, selection bias. They took them out. They didn't want to see them. We're going to model them. Cancer cells are very hard to poison, and here's why. There's something called a P-glycoprotein. It's a, little, it's a transporter uh, on a membrane, and it's a, a broad-spectrum antito antitoxin. It pulls everything out. It's the vacuum cleaner of the cells. And so you've got the cell, and it's stressed. It's not doing too well. It upregulates its P-glycoprotein so it can try to clean itself. It gets more stressed. More people are going to put it Eventually, he says, okay, that's ridiculous. I'm just going to become cancer. But what has it got a huge number of? It's got all these people like proteins, which basically means it is the most toxic resistant cell in your entire body. But we're going to go after it with chemo? Bad idea. Not that chemo couldn't work, okay? Um, cancer cells love ammonia, and they have metal transport problems, right? They've learned to eat ammonia, a toxin, because they've been so toxic so long, right? If you mix ammonia with zinc and copper, it gobbles up the ammonia. Zinc and copper come for the ride, but then it can't get out, can't get rid of it because it doesn't have good transports and pumps anymore. You put enough zinc and copper in any cell, it's gonna blow up. Okay, Sun Tzu approves of the theory, good. <laughs> because you never want to attack your enemy where they're strong. You attack them in a week. Okay, well, how about alternative medicine? You give oxygen therapy, it's not gonna deal with glycolysis, but it won't reverse the ones that have already gone. Ketogenic diet, sure, yeah, but your liver makes sugar anyway. Juicing raises your pH, mm, okay, but if you really want to push it, to cesium. Cell voltage, probably don't have time to talk about that here. Uh, real quick. Uh, normal cells, 30, negative 37 to negative 93 ish. Cancer cells below that. If you take a healthy cell and bring it to a very low negative voltage, it becomes cancerous. And if you take a, a cancer cell and you raise its voltage to a greater negative potential, it stops dividing. Very important. But uh, and that gets into the fact that we are not in electrical conductivity with the earth, and we wore our sold shoes. Our body is meant to be in a state of flow, with electrons moving. But what happens is you wear clothing and you walk around on carpets, and you don't ground yourself, and you lose all of that. That flow uh, backfires on us. We lose all of our electrons into the artificial materials, and our voltage crashes. All right, intermittent fasting. Okay, there's four paths for their cells we don't in the body. If you stop eating, it's autophagy. If you get hungry, everybody should get hungry once a week. I mean, really hungry, okay? It's gonna digest the cycle, uh, digest and work, work on uh, recycle them. Best way to go. And we can talk about it maybe after, I'll tell you the best way to fast. Aptosis, second best way to go, okay? That's when the cells shrink uh, and the membrane stays intact. It's like putting a grape in a dehydrator, it shrinks down, it's not an inflammatory cycle. Second best, but it requires ATP. Now we're getting nasty, right? Necrosis. This is where the cells don't have enough ATP to do this one. ATP, mitochondria, energy. The membrane ruptures is pro-inflammatory, it's a mess. If it escapes all three of these, boom, cancer. All right, how could we boost the cancer response system? Unlike heart disease that affects only a few species, we can't learn from animals. Cancer affects almost every animal and plant. So we can learn from the plants and animals what they figured out. And indeed, there are three really cool animals in this world that were related to cancer. Elephants, ants, and the naked mole rat. Let's talk about them. Elephants are the steroid of cancer. They live a long time, they're very large, which are both cancer risks. And they, um, then they have, the reason is they have 20 copies of the TP53 gene, which we'll get into in a second. We have one, maybe two, depending on who you talk to. TP53 gene, it stops, if it looks at a cell and says, you look funny, stop. It's all cell arrest. It fixes it if it can, kills it if it can with apoptosis, assuming you've got enough ATP to pull that off, right? Half of all cancers in humans are a crash of the TB53 gene, and how does it crash? Among other things, the herpes family, CMV, epstein barr human papilloma virus, chicken pox, they all get TB that gene. Ants don't get cancer. They don't live very long, so, but still, I don't think they get cancer. They have no offense, and they have an amazing defense. They just repair themselves so fast, it doesn't matter. And they do that with a product that they make in a body called herdoidal. The naked mole rat lives seven times longer than a similar house, uh, a mouse-sized animal. They cannot be given cancer in a lab. That's a neat trick. Naked mole rat, how do you do that? Well, they make a lot of hyaluronic acid. It's connective tissue. But what it means is, and I think they can get cancer, but I think they get the microtumors, and they don't go to the next stage. Their connective tissue is so strong, it can't invade. And they make very little hyaluronic acid, hyaluronic acid enzyme, so they don't break down what they've got. So, 
how can we more like, be more like these three animals? Elagic acid found in pomegranates and all sorts of things causes cell arrest, repairs DNA, triggers apoptosis. That's a TB53 gene analog. Everybody should be taking elagic acid. It's cheap and it's fantastic. Uh, okay, iridoidal. You can get that. You just have to eat ant extract. And it's like coffee. <laughs> Hyaluronic acid uh, and phylanthus uh, umbilicate, absorbable palmitate, these will suppress. So you can also eat hyaluronic acid, like the naked mole rat. We've got the elephant, we've got the ant. You can eat hyaluronic acid, but you also have to suppress the enzyme that breaks it down. And uh, more shameless product placements. Uh, you can make doodle yourself, or you can buy it from me. This is the stuff we're working on with the zinc and the ammonia. And tumor lysis challenge. Okay. Uh, how much time have I got? Two minutes. Uh, when cancer cells die, there's a very specific and predictable change in the blood chemistry. So, wouldn't it be great if someone took a drop of your blood, said here's your baseline, gave you some things that will aggressively kill cancer, checked your blood again and see if anything changed? Mm. That's what I would call a tumor lysis challenge. I believe we all need some TLC. <laughs> you do that once a year, fantastic. So, here's how I work in my practice. You come in, I'm going to look at you with ultrasound, and I'm going to look in your eye, all clear, see you next year, go back and do the great things you're doing. A little bit of blockage, but you've got any blood vessels growing? That's great. Here's a few products, go out, go back, do what you're doing. Lots of blockage, and you're not making new blood vessels. Okay, now we're going to work. Now I've got a little bit of work I've got to do with you, and let's monitor it, and when I start seeing you popping new blood vessels, great, go back, get in the game. What happens if I see cancer markers, right? As I start seeing a lot of vascularity in places, things like, oh, that, that, that doesn't look good. All right? That's when you want to start to do something like a tumor lysis challenge. If the challenge is negative, meaning, you know what? Nothing, nothing going on. You've got, it, you've got it. You're under control. Okay. But I still, I still see some micro tumors. They just haven't gone anywhere. Fantastic. Here's a mild preventative protocol. See you next year. If the challenge is positive, that's when you get aggressive. I'm going to see you next week. Uh, if I might have 10 seconds to answer questions, shoot. <laughs> What's up? Distilled water? No. No, it's oxidized. Uh, if you're going to do a fast, if you're going to do a fast, which you do is a steam juice fast, where you take vegetables and a side of, you know, chicken leg or something, you steam it until it's tasteless and colorless, drink the water, that's all your water-soluble um, elements so that you're not deficient, you can still work while you're fasting. Um, if you're interested in working with me or the kind of stuff I do, I'm at remedylink.com, you can grab my business card. We have within us the capacity to deal with the most frightening things that the doctors would spook us about, cancer and heart attack. Your body has that capacity. If you keep it detoxed, if you give it just a little bit of smart supplementation, you're good to go. Poco is so hype, I'm trying to tell ya This the event of the year And best vacation ever Ryan Potter, Jeffrey Tucker Just to name a few Get your tickets, you don't want to miss it You should roll through Talking politics to health and self-improvement To investing, so many things, not one thing Learn how to live life unchained, yeah Four days vibing on the beach Time to connect, all about growth Way more than a conference This is Anarchapoco, yeah Let's go you ain't seen nothing yet.